Good morning. You know, Chris, I think uh, you got prayed up this day. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that, but uh, good. appreciate you, uh, you stepping in and serving, and uh, it's good to see you all here this day and have this chance to worship together. Well, today, maybe you wondered if we'd ever get here, we're finishing up our series through Revelation, and we're going to be in chapters 21 and 22, and in these chapters, we're going to be told of a day where, where God is going to make all things new. And if you just take a chance, and you do have to take a chance, it's a risk to watch the world news tonight, uh, but you usually see a segment there where they will have uh, pictures of parts of the world that are uh, been abandoned or maybe forgotten or, or there's major problems. There's maybe a village that was, uh, has the scars of war or uh, political strife and unrest. Maybe it's a place where many people's lives have been claimed because of you know, HIV, AIDS, or parts of the, of the world that you know, COVID has economically disrupted their lives. Places where there are orphans and, and many tears. But the promise of revelation for us is, and, and it's a promise of a new community in heaven. And we're, we're told in Revelation 21, and, and it's that there will be no more, no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And actually in verse 5 says that, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. So for those who might have felt abandoned, who have experienced, it seems like, just a ton of tribulation and suffering and sorrow, it's a promise that heaven gives us hope. And really for us who live here in southwest Missouri in Greene County or Christian County, this is a problem that a promise that we hold on to. This is where we put our hope. We don't put our hope in our local government. We don't put our hope in our, our federal government. We don't put our hope in this world. We put our hope in the world to come. And in, in a world where there will be no more death and no more mourning, no more sorrow, no more pain. And that's the day that we long for. Some years ago, I was on a mission trip to Costa Rica and to northern Panama. We went up to where the, the Waimea Indians lived. One day we were walking with this young boy who was taking us to his home. Now, when I say home, I need to clarify a few things because where they lived was extreme poverty. And, and his home was, was built. Some homes had mud walls. Some were just that of thatched leaves. They had 10 on the roof. There was no electricity, was no running water. His was a one-room house. And on the way as we're going to this young man's home, he asked us, he said, what, what's it like to live in the United States of America? Well, that's a tough question to answer. And I've always found it kind of difficult to try to explain it to people that lived in the, the poverty uh, settings like that. Because you think about it, even the seasons, if you are in, in the tropics there, even the seasons are hard to explain. They had no clue of what it means like in the fall when the leaves fall off. And, and, or they don't understand what, what is, it's like when it gets cold and, and we have, have snowfall. I mean, they may have heard about it, but it's very difficult to, to describe to somebody in that kind of setting. I mean, how do you describe? How do you describe your bedroom to somebody? How do you describe your pillow top mattress and your pillows to somebody who has a mat on the floor that they sleep on and they roll up and put in a corner and it's in the same room? How do you describe what you do for entertainment? Families, you know, go to amusement parks and, and ride rides. I mean, that is a realm beyond comprehension. 
and it's really far outside of their experience to really understand it. It just doesn't translate well because our worlds are, are greatly different. And the same is really true when you return to the United States and people ask you, well, what, what's it like in the Caribbean? What's it like in, in, in Costa Rica? What's it like in, in Panama? And you see the experiences. You can show them pictures. You can do your best to describe. I mean, because even when I was there, Panama had been in parts of that world, and there it was a Pan American highway. There, the bus would have to watch out for big chunks of the highway that had been blown out by mortar fire because it was after, after a war had gone through there. But there are still parts of the Caribbean where the blues are just extra blue. We have blue, but they have real blue in the Caribbean. And sometimes, you know, the greens are, we have green, but they have some real vibrant greens. And it's hard to describe something so beautiful if you've never experienced it yourself. And it can be frustrating for both the person who's doing the describing as well as the person who's trying to, to understand because our worlds are just so far apart. I think John kind of had an experience like that as he's writing Revelation and trying to describe for us our heavenly home. And perhaps he felt that, kind of, felt that kind of frustration. I mean, he's been trying to tell us things that God had revealed to him for him to, to show us and be allowed to. He saw a glimpse of heaven and he used the language some poetic language, some beautiful imagery, and he pushed the human language to the limit, trying to reveal to us the unveiling of heaven. But ultimately, our worlds are just vastly different, and it's hard for us to understand what heaven will be like. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither entered into the thoughts and minds of men. Or as some translation says, no mind can or has conceived what God has prepared for them who love him. And so there's this sense that just no matter how the competent the communicator is, no matter how much beauty the picture can be painted, no matter any of that stuff, our minds cannot see. Our eyes are just not able to, to see and hear and, and, and understand all the things that God has prepared. I mean, we can't even begin to imagine what God has prepared for us in heaven. It's just too different from the broken world that we now live. And that's how we're ending this series. That's how we're ending this series. We're going to try to, to get a little better picture of heaven and what it'll be like. And once again, I think the message for us is quite simple. Be ready. Be ready. John is going to, to talk to us in Revelation 21 about what he sees in heaven. We find in verse 1 he says this description. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And the word I want us to remember here and think of, and if you circle words in your Bible, this would be a good one to do, but it's this word new. Now, it's a word that's going to be used multiple times here. We, we see it again in verse 5 where it says, I, Jesus says, I will make all things new. And here this, this word new is, is kind of a difficult word for us to, uh, to explain and understand. You'd think it's an easy word. It's a simple word. But it's new. New as in totally new, but not brand new. It, it's new so that we may not recognize the old, but it's not completely new. This new heaven, this new earth. We, we, we read about a new heaven and a new earth, but what we need to understand here is it's new. It's completely new, but we have the same artist. We have the same designer. We have the same architect. 
There's something very, very familiar about it. It's better. It's beyond our imagination. But there's something about the new heaven and the new earth that is familiar. And that is God is our creator. It's the very best of this world and even better. Because it's minus the brokenness. Minus the sin. It's a new heaven. It's a new earth. And in verse 2, John says, I saw a holy city. I saw a holy city. And here again, he says, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. I think this is important for us to understand. Where is heaven coming from? It's coming from God. Heaven is coming from God as it's been prepared by God. Think about this. God's been working on heaven for nearly 2,000 years. Took him six days to create this world in which we live and which we probably all think is pretty amazing and pretty beautiful. I mean, he's been working on heaven for 2,000 plus years. We're living in a garbage can compared to what we got waiting for us. It's amazing. And then, and then God gives us this, this new analogy. He's preparing this place. It's prepared for as a bride adorned for her husband. And so this city here is described like this. Now, I know probably most of us would fall in this category. Describing a city wouldn't really be that big of a deal for us. Wouldn't be really that appealing. I mean, uh, we're rural people. We like our elbow room. I mean, that's one of the things about the concrete jungle. You don't have as much elbow room. But we like a little bit of space. And John is going to give us a description here. And he's going to lay out for us some dimensions. And it's like nothing that we could even uh, ever imagine. Because this, this city is described, and he says in, in, in Revelation 21, verse uh, 15 through 17, the angel who talked with me, had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found that it would be 12,000 stadia uh, in length as wide and high as it was or is long. So here we have these dimensions. Here they are. They're a little different than what we might be thinking of measuring space. Because it goes up, not just back and forth. And in the angel measured the walls using human measurements. And they measured some 144 cubics thick. Now, a cubit would be typically for a man is between the top of his fingers to his elbow. And it's roughly 18 inches. I measured mine one time and it's 22 inches. So I throw the whole thing off. But if you take that measurement, we're finding here the walls are 144 cubits. That's over a little over 200 feet. That's actually 216 feet thick. And this is consistent when we read in numerous places in the New Testament that heaven is described as this city, a new Jerusalem. And in verse 23, it says that the city does not need the sun nor the moon to shine because, you see, uh, the glory of God gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Now, the city is described here in, Gen in, in chapter 21 using these measurements. And John points out that these are human measurements. Now, the way my mind thinks about that is that kind of indicates that this is perhaps something that is more literal as a number than figurative. Not as figurative. Now, I'm not really great at math. In my family, the math gene skipped. It was with my brother. It's landed on my girls, but it skipped me. And I'm not real familiar with the stadia measurement. Now, I have read some people who, who are better at math, and they can explain it in such a way that if you, even if you don't have the math gene, you can understand it. And they understand what they're talking about. And they say that what we're talking about here is a space of about 1,500 miles cubed. It's a space that, that seems to indicate different levels 
because of the height measurements. And if you do the math with this, you'll find out that on one level, there could be some 45 million miles of road. Now, 10 blocks per mile. That's the city, you know, measurements. But Jesus said, remember, in my father's house are many mansions. So someone did run the numbers on this. And, and they said, if you put four mansions on every block, that would equal over one of our about one billion mansions. That's a lot of mansions. How many of you like parades of homes? Any of you like to go on parade of homes? You know, visiting other homes and enjoying and discovering the things that you don't have? The learning discontentment? I mean, it's nice, you know, to spend an afternoon, spend some kind of evening, and you start coveting other things. Because some people just like sin. You know, they want to cover other things that other people have. Well, just imagine if heaven had this opportunity for this parade of homes and you get to go see mansions. And if you saw 60 mansions per hour and you did that for 12 hours a day, it would take you 6 million years to see them all. That's 6 million years. That's a huge parade of homes. And most of us would probably say, I don't see that as heaven. As a prayer, maybe I ended up somewhere else there. But the whole idea here is the picture is that heaven is, is vast, it's expansive, it's huge. Revelation is also telling us that there's space that's inside the city and outside, which indicates that there's plenty of a space for us to explore. There's territory inside and outside the walls. I, I love spring, it's my favorite time of the year after a Things are dormant, you know, for a couple of months, and I love to see the colors start popping and new life emerging, and it just amazes me to see this kind of beauty. And then if I look at the creation, my mind will wander to the beauty of heaven. What would it be like to explore God's new creation? What would it be like to, to step outside those walls? and go on a heavenly hike and just explore a new heaven and a new earth. John says, here's what it'll be like. And then he starts painting a picture for us of incredible beauty. In verse 18, we read about something, you know, streets paved of gold. How precious is gold in our society today? And it's so common in heaven that they can pave the streets of gold. Think of all some of the uh, uh, other beautiful s s walls of sapphire and diamonds and other color references of emeralds and rubies. And we see the deep greens and transparent purples. And I mean, it's just a beautiful, vibrant, vibrant colors, description. Verse 22, or excuse me, verse 2 of chapter 21 says that it's like God. And he's prepared this as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. One of my favorite parts in performing a wedding is standing up with the groom. The next wedding I'm a part of, I'm not going to get to see that. You know, every groom I've been around has been a little nervous. He is, he's just anxious. He's waiting for, you know, his bride to appear and to walk down. I mean, she's been preparing herself. Seems like maybe for weeks. I, I don't know exactly what they do, but they're getting ready. They're getting ready, and, and she's getting ready, and maybe the door will open up. The music start playing, and she appears, and you look at the bride, as beautiful as she is. And then if you just watch out of the corner of your eye, the groom, you can just see with a deep breath and a sigh, all the anxiousness disappearing as he focuses on the beautiful bride. And, and he sees how she has prepared herself for him because she loves him. And that's the imagery that's used here of heaven. That God has been preparing this place out of love for you. 
God has been preparing this place out of love for me. This beautiful place. And we focus on that. We, we set our eyes to it. We fix our minds on it. And we are renewed and we are strengthened as we see it that he has prepared for us. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Now John describes for us in heaven that it's going to be a place where there is delicious food. Last week we talked a little bit about uh, verse 9 of chapter 19 about you know eating in heaven or the, the wedding supper of the Lamb. And after Jesus uh, arose... Her, his resurrected body, he took on food. He took on food. I'm glad that we're going to get to eat in heaven, aren't you? I'm glad. I mean, I mean, in heaven, it's going to be awesome because, I mean, that's one of the things that tells us we're in a broken down and fallen world. Because here on this side of eternity, everything that tastes good is bad for you. And everything that doesn't taste quite so good is what's good for it. You know, and, but, but when we get to heaven, the things that are delicious will be good for us. I mean, all of the result of that was because the world is upside down and turning topsy-turvy. And that's all because of, of sin and the brokenness. But Jesus is going to make everything right. And when he, he returns, all things will be made right. And so those things that are delicious will be nutritious. And it'll be able to be enjoyed. And it's a different kind of satisfaction. A different kind of enjoyment. In heaven, it's going to be a place of health. Perfect health. No more sickness. No more pain. And here's the deal. For some of us, some of you have had to deal with so much of that. That when you hear no more sickness, no more pain, I'm in. <laughs> That's all I need to hear. That place is for me. And we can only imagine, we can only, because days sometimes are not filled with clear minds and, and strong bodies and no pain. That, that's so foreign to us, and it's been foreign to some folks all of their lives. And all we really know is the existence of some pain and sickness and medication, because we live in a world where that's just a part of our life. But in heaven... None of that. No more medication. No more pain. No more sickness. Heaven's also going to be a place of rest. John describes in, in John 14, verse 13, be still. He, and, and we need to know I am God from the psalmist. But we need. he says that, that in Christ we will rest from our labors. And for some of you, you need to hear that. Because you're worn out and you're tired. You're carrying burdens, or you know people that are carrying burdens. And it's just daily. And it's just like, man, if I could just make it through the day. And then there are people, people, it's just 24-7. Maybe it's just because of their job or whatever it is that they're doing. Maybe it's because there, so many people are depending on them, and they just carry those loads with it. And they need to be reminded what the psalmist said, to be still and know that I am God. And we try here on earth to remind ourselves that God is on the throne and we can rest and we can find peace in that knowledge. But in heaven, it's not just going to be thinking about maybe is God up there or not. We're going to see that God is on his throne. We are going to know that he's on his throne. And my guess is the rest that we will experience is going to be extra special. It'll be a deeper rest than we can possibly even imagine here on this earth, in this place. This side of eternity. It's not to say that we're going to get bored in heaven. I think that's a fear that some people have. Like, you know, eternity is a long time. What am I going to be doing all that time? Well, for some people, the idea, just being able to have a place to go and to just rest doesn't appeal to them. But that's not what heaven is going to be like. Because John describes in, in verse 22, or, chap, or chapter 22, verse 3, that the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. And that is to tell us that we're going to have meaningful jobs and tasks that we're going to be doing. 
and things that we're going to be passionate about and that God has made us to be and, and we are to worship him and part of our worship will be that act of service of meaningful service it's going to be a place of learning can you imagine learning from some of the most skilled people in all of history can you imagine taking a writing class from C.S. Lewis or how about taking a carpentry class from Joseph just lifetime learning you know worship at the church in David Panama these people there were quite expressive as they worshiped there was a lot of singing and a lot of dancing and and you know I, I'm not much into dancing for me you know dance I'm just like this I'm all here that's me that's the way it gets no farther than that but these people were it was an aerobic experience okay they were very excited and having a wonderful time and at the beginning because I was the biggest in our group I think is why the missionary pastor asked me to come up and I want you to lead in 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 you know the, in the dance and in the song and the dance and, and if my girls had been born at that time they'd have hung their head in shame well <laughs> dad don't you know and I, tell, I told him, I said, you know what? I think one day in heaven we're going to all worship. It would be fine. But I think right now God would say, don't, don't. That's fine. For Bruce, just you, let everybody else do it, but you just don't, you know. Heaven's going to be a place of uninhibited worship. John says there in verse, nine, uh, verse 7 of chapter 19, what it'll be like and he says we're going to join in the multitudes and say hallelujah for the lord our god reigns lord almighty reigns let us rejoice and be glad and just think think of this feel think of the thrill of this we get a taste occasionally in this life where we might be in settings and you know we were created for worship and God loves to us to to walk with him and to talk with him and to to be in his presence and and sometimes we get a glimpse of that where we just feel like we're in a setting where we just feel so at home like we are in the presence of God but then we're going to get to worship God face to face and so John paints a picture and says here is what you can expect in heaven here is what it's going to be like. Here is what it's going to look like as he describes our heavenly home. You know, we have a lot of needs in our little city. We have a lot of needs in our state, in our country. There are a lot of needs around the world. And I think the one thing that is needed most in our world today is hope hope we all need hope from God's Word and in Revelation 21 John gives us hope and, and what strikes me here is that when John describes heaven he doesn't tell us what is going to be there he tells us what's not going to be there and it's if he's tried he said you know here poetically I've, I've tried to paint a picture for you and the use of words and let's let's just Try another angle here, and I'm going to tell you what's not going to be there. And that's what we read in Revelation 21 and verses 3 through 5, where he says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he'll live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. And here we go. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. No more. John's saying, maybe this will help you recognize. Let me tell you what there won't be there. I got a list that I've come up with. Certainly not exhaustive. It's close, though. <laughs> of the no mores in heaven. There'll be no more cancer of any kind, no more divorce, no more rejection, no more loneliness, depression, no more band-aids, no more tissue boxes, no more caskets, no more crutches, no more wheelchairs or pacemakers or radiation or chemotherapy or multiple sclerosis or bloated stomach or suicide bomber or school shootings. 
No more medical uh, metal detectors or persecution. No more x-rays or MRIs. No more anxiety medication or middle of the night phone calls. No more crosses along the side of the road or miscarriages or child abuse or rape or breakup or tornado sirens or typhoons or, or tsunami or earthquake or hurricane warnings. No more coughs due to colds. No more flu shots or vaccines. No more acne or love handles or saddlebags or bad breath or body odor or deodorant or deodorant stains. No more uh, shaving or uh, plucking or waxing or roguing or socks that don't match. No more stubbing your toes or, or yelling after you stub your toe. No more fighting or bullying or traffic or road rage. No more racism or addiction or drama or hormones. No more crass diets or, or spanks or, or gossip or guilt or legalism or pretending or, or injustice. No more infertility. No more infidelity. No more insecurity. No more infomercials. No more inoperable tumors, no more security systems, no more amber alerts, no more embarrassing moments, no more sleepless nights, concussions, no more autism, no more bipolar disorders, no more sensory issues, no more child protective services, no more doctors, no more needles, no more taxes or tax bills, no more bill collectors or mechanics or dentists or lawyers, no more plastic surgeons. No more lying, no more politicians, no more lying politicians, no more elections, no more funeral homes or nursing homes or orphanages or waiting rooms or animal hospitals or treatment centers, courtrooms, broken homes, slums, tear-stained divorce papers, pink slips, foreclosure notices, abortion, motionless ultrasounds, no more tiny caskets. No more death, no more sadness, no more loneliness or insecurities or crying or pain. He who has seated on the throne says, I make all things new. It's all new. And here's the question. John asked for us in this last, he says, how long will it be? How much longer? How much longer? Well, in verse 7, he says, I am coming soon. And then John says in verse 12, I am coming soon. And then John ends the Bible by saying, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And that's our prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, I just want to say thank you that this world is not our hope that there is more than what we see. And we don't find our strength in this life, but Father, we find it in the life that's promised to come. And Lord, would you help, help us to set our minds on things that are above. Help us, Father, to, to look to our heavenly home. And would you, Lord, give us the hope and the strength and the joy that we need for today. Lord, would you motivate us today and every day what it will be like on that day. Help us to be ready. Father, help us to know that nothing, positively, absolutely nothing, truly matters in life except for preparing for the next. And would you ready our hearts for your soon coming return. It's in the name of Jesus I ask this. Amen. You know, in this series, we've talked a lot about what to expect, what it's like. We've talked about heaven. We talk about it again and again. The message is very simple. Be ready. Be ready. And as we finish this series, I think it's really important for us to recognize the challenge that we've got to take to this lost and dying world. And that's the challenge for people to come to Christ. And the Bible tells us we get ready, and it's not because of the things that we do. It's not because uh, that we're good enough. It's not because we've had the righteous deeds. It's not because, you know, we're good at keeping religious rules. But it's because we put our faith and trust in Jesus. We put our faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. We can't save ourselves. The only thing that can save us is the blood of Jesus, that perfect spotless lamb who who 
who went to the cross in our behalf is putting our faith and trust in him. That's how we find salvation. And that's how we get ready. So this morning, if there is anyone here that just has any questions regarding what it means to be a Christian, what it is that they need to do in their life to get ready, you can meet me down front. I'll be right here. Glad to talk to you. Maybe you'd like to unite your life with this fellowship. You know, uh, join us on this journey of being ready. Because I think that's the journey of Westside. We want to be ready. And, and you know what? We're not a perfect church. But I think we're a family that wants to prepare for Christ's return together. And I look forward to meeting all others at, that have been a part of this fellowship at that western gate. I do think there is a western gate there for us to gather around and maybe meet and enjoy that time of worship together. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. If that's the need of your life this day, I invite you to stand, won't you, as we sing. Up and being here this day. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. And I hope that you uh, have been blessed by our time in worship and in praise today. Don't forget the announcements that are in the bulletin. And did you decide anything as far as the board meeting goes? Okay, okay. That'll be just real quick then. And uh, don't, uh, the other announcements that are in the bulletin, don't, don't forget them. Let's close with a word of prayer. Almighty God, thank you for the privilege and honor it is to be in your presence this day. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to gather and sing songs of praise to your name, to gather around your table of love and memory, and Lord, for a chance to just open your word and to receive, Father, a, a message of hope of what you have prepared. We know that no eye has seen and ear has heard, neither has entered into the hearts and minds of men the things that God has prepared for them that love him. And Lord, we look forward with great anticipation for what we want to be a part of. And help us, Father, as we leave this place, that we would leave in a way that we're ready, Father, to meet you at any time. And we look forward. And with John, we want to pray, come, Lord Jesus. For it's in your name we ask this. Amen. Have a great day. We're glad that you've joined us for today's sermon. We trust that you have been blessed from this opportunity to be able to open and study God's word together. If you have any questions that you would like answered, if you would like more information about the Christian life or how to become a Christian or Westside Christian Church, you can contact us at 417-732-6082 or email us at minister at westsidechristian.church. Thanks again for joining us at Westside today. Westside Christian Church is a church that truly loves God, loves others, and strives to be in service to all. Have a great day.